Daniel Harris, good morning to you. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm good. We, we are definitely going to talk about Manchester United and uh, what happened at the weekend. But I do want to get your thoughts on how Jose Mourinho is handling things at uh, Spurs before we get into that. You know, he's got his superstar signing imminently arriving. The team was amazing in that second half against uh, Southampton at the weekend. So all is rosy in Jose's garden, right? Uh, not sure. Um, I think that you will see with Mourinho that his teams, like, have, they've had good players, so they will produce some good performances. But it still doesn't really look like they've got a method that's going to work and that's going to help them dominate games. I guess if you can start getting the best out of Tangy and Dombele, that would make a huge difference because ultimately the way it is at the moment is their defence isn't particularly good. They've got really good attackers and not a whole lot going on in midfield. I mean, they had, I think, Winks and Hoberg uh, played at the, bot at the base of midfield um, in the first game and then it was Soka and Hoberg in Europe and ultimately they're worthy players. They're not rubbish players, but they're not players that are going to enable you to dominate a game. And at that point, you're basically relying on good attackers combining at some point during that game to do enough to win you the game. And it felt quite a lot like that was really what happened against Southampton. But if uh, Tangy and Dombley can become the player that Spurs thought he was, then that would make a huge difference. But otherwise, I think what we might see is that, I mean, we saw a bit of it at the weekend, actually, is... Harry Kane, as well as being a brilliant finisher, Harry Kane is an excellent target man and a really good passer. And it seems that he's going to be dropping a little bit deeper for fast players in front of him. And obviously when Gareth Bale arrives, that will still be the case, assuming Gareth Bale is still fast. Um, I, I was watching this game on uh, Twitter and catching up with it on social media. It seemed to me that the reports were that Ndombele had been a uh, preordained punishment substitute for doing something clever and creative in the first half. That was certainly how... Um, Twitter responding when he was hauled off a little bit early. Um, it's hard to know really what's going on with Mourinho because he he does things that have no apparent explanation or at least no explanation that will help his team and help help his club become what he's meant to be there stewarding them to become. And it just seems so unlikely that Mourinho is suddenly going to change to become to go back to the Mourinho that was so brilliant and so compelling at the beginning of his career. It seems much more like if I was a Spurs fan, anyhow, I would be hoping that he managed to not wind up some of the players that I least wanted to leave into leaving or to mentally checking out so that by the time the replacement turns up, they've got arrangements to go somewhere else. And it felt like when Mourinho was with, with United, that happened just in time, more or less that the players had clearly had enough, but they fired him just before the players would sort of start deciding where else they might go. Given the signing of Reggion and Bale over the last couple of days, Daniel, it seems that Spurs fans are hoping for Jose Mourinho to tweak his system a little bit to, I guess, encapsulate their specific talents over the next little while. How naive is that expectation that Jose Mourinho might change? Um, I, don't, I think the, the, the expectation he'll change is changes an individual is extremely unlikely, but um, I mean, he might change formation because he's bought two fullbacks who are probably better deployed as wingbacks. Uh, so it is possible that Spurs might change to a 3-4-3 because that would give their centre-backs who aren't that reliable safety in numbers as well. And then you could, like Matt Doherty is, is a really good player, but he's a much better right wingback than a fullback because he's good in front of goal. He's a good finisher and he gets into good positions. And the same with Reguillon is he... He's great. He's great going forward. He'll hopefully have the requisite level of recovery pace to do to, to be good. At, uh, to, uh, I think I think we have one of those disturbances right now. Um, <laughs> you know, there appears to be a door magically opening. I wonder what could be behind it. Um, well, we have um, Reguillon is um, yeah, like he's really fast. He's really good on the ball, but you would want him going forward as much as possible, not going backwards. So. I think that um, it might it might work out to change to a three four three, and I mean Mourinho's usually been a, a four three three bloke, so four or four two three one guys. So it would require some level of change, but I think that is much more likely than Mourinho becoming an extremely different personality to the one that we've seen. And even though he has sort of changed over his career, because what we've seen from Mourinho is that he's basically become consumed by the bad elements that he always had and they're kind of dampened down the bits that everyone really loved about him in the first place. So he has kind of changed, but 
I don't think he's going to... I think I don't think he's suddenly going to switch back to the Mourinho 15 years ago, but you never know. Because like, I think one of the problems with Mourinho since he left Real Madrid, I guess, is that he's got this stubborn refusal to look at the squad that he's got, look at the players that he's got, and look at the teams that they're playing against and alter what he expects from a football team and from footballers, depending on what he has available to him. So... If Mourinho, like, because you people talk about Mourinho's football being outdated, and it might not be the most modern interpretation of how to play, but if you stuck, and I say this a lot, if you stuck his first Chelsea team into this Premier League, they would come very close to winning it because brilliant players are brilliant players, and incredible mentality is incredible mentality. And Mourinho's first Chelsea team had absolutely shitloads of that, um, and football football is unchanging. So um, where you have talent and mentality, then that will override almost everything that any other team is going to do when you have it in that, the, the quantities that he had it in. But what he hasn't done is he hasn't adapted the way that he man-manages according to different individuals. You're not always going to have ludicrously driven professionals like Lampard, Drogba, SCN, Czech, Terry. And he also hasn't adapted the way that he likes his teams to play according to the, the style of player that he has and the kind of players that he has. And I, it doesn't really look like that's going to change, but maybe he'll change to three four three because he's basically signed himself two wing backs. Hey, does there also have to come an acceptance from Jose Mourinho that we now live in a, I, I guess a, an era where I, I guess defensive solidity is less valued. I'm not I'm not even sure if less valued is the right phrase there because you know we've just seen a weekend where we've had 44 goals in one Premier League weekend, the highest ever scoring match day in, in, in Premier League history. Uh, like, are, how long does this sustain for Daniel? Is this quite a, an early flash in the pan for a season and things will come back to the norm? Or is there an acceptance that, no, we need to have a capability of scoring five goals uh, every three or four games? I mean, well, Mourinho's, Mourinho's team scored a lot of goals. His good team mm. scored a load of goals. I remember there was, there was a time when his Chelsea team, when they had Robin and Duff and, uh, and Drogba, was scoring, they went through a phase where it just seemed like they were scoring four goals in every game. So I don't think that I don't think defensive solidity is out of fashion. I think that there aren't that many good defenders in the world at the moment. That sometimes happens, and I think that um, to, uh, uh, teams want defenders to be able to bring the ball out from the back as well. But if you had a team like Liverpool last season, I think they won 15 league games by the old goal, something like that. And that's partly because you have a lot of match winners and it's partly because you don't concede that many goals and you don't concede that many goals at crucial times. Good defending is still important. I mean, the team with the best defence in the Premier League last season pissed the Premier League last season. It's not a coincidence. I think three out of the last four years has been the case as well. Um, let's talk about the, the situation at Manchester United. Um, not to, to paint in two broad brushstrokes, but who is responsible for what we're seeing at the moment? Is it Woodward or is it Solskjaer? Um, it depends what we mean by what we're seeing. I mean, if we talk about what we're seeing in the first instance as a crap performance against Palace, I would say that it would be a strange individual who looked at that game and didn't think that the major difference between the teams was fitness. I'm going to come on to the differences that weren't fitness in a second because obviously it would also be a moron who said that was it. But the major difference between the team was, was fitness. I mean, Andros Townsend talked about it in his interview. He knew that they had a lot more games in their legs than United did. United, Some of United's players had played um, against Villa the week before. I think Palace had played six friendlies or something and also played a league game and they'd won it, so they had a lot of confidence. And United didn't have that. And uh, Palace won that game, really. I mean, I know they scored twice towards the end, but Palace won that game in the first 15 minutes where they basically laid the smack down, where they were quicker to the ball than United, they were sharper, they were more confident than United because they knew that they were going to be quicker and they knew that they were going to be sharper. And Andros Townsend said exactly that, and, and that was what happened. Now, that's not all that was going on there, but I think it's also worth saying that Palace were really bad opponents. As I said, they were fit, much, much fitter. They'd won their first game, and also they have really good attackers. And they're really quick on the break and they're really quick on the press. And that was more or less what happened. Um, so those were, I would say, the, the two main reasons why United got beat like the way that they did was um, was the, the difference in fitness and Palace just being a really bad opponent when you're not fit like United weren't. But thought that Ole got the team wrong. I couldn't believe he didn't pick Van de Beek for those reasons. I knew that United would be slow and tired relative to Palace. But then you've got a guy who has actually had some semblance of a pre-season and is a new signing, so might give your team some impetus and you leave him on the bench. thought that was a ridiculous decision. Um, 
also, United went into that game with Fossi Mensa um, at right back, um, McTominay towards the right midfield, and uh, Daniel James on the right wing. I mean, that is effectively saying we're going to forget about this right side of the pitch. And I'm not sure if there was anything Ole could have done better than that. But I think one of the other reasons United got beat like that was the players played out their asses. And sometimes that will happen. And when you when you have lots of brilliant attackers, and United do have that, you hope that one of them will get you out of jail in a situation like that. But um, sometimes it just doesn't work out where they all play badly. And that was what happened. I mean, Pogba was dreadful. Martial was dreadful. Fernandez, Fernandez went missing. I mean, that's, that's hardly happened at all. So you have all those things. So you have all those things combining. And they all combine together to deliver what we saw to be the result. And that is just, again, there are lots of reasons. The problem for United now is that there's not a particular reason to think they'll be loads fitter tonight at the weekend and they can't afford the bad start because then you start to get into the speculation of, well, is the manager good enough? Are the players good enough? Um, and a good start is really important. I think that, I mean, a good start is really important. I mean, what a ludicrous thing to say. But for a, for a good team, and you can think back to seasons when United won the league, they didn't always win the first couple of games. They started slowly and it was still possible for something to happen. But I think about uh, 2006-07 when United hadn't won the league for three seasons and they started the thrash for them 5-1 on the first day and they took the momentum and they took that through the opening part of the season. And as a new team looking to ascend to a level that they hadn't reached yet, that was really important. Um, and United need to find a way of getting a result. And I mean, quite a lot of it is just the players playing better. Um, it was... And we're talking about the touch, we're talking about the movement and the decision-making, things that, even though they're not fit, they should be doing better. And I, I, I would expect to see quite a strong team tonight against Luton because the players need a game and they need some confidence before they play in the league at the weekend, whereas ordinarily you would expect quite a lot of young players to play, uh, to play in the League Cup. I, I don't think that's going to happen tonight because I think it's too important to get the miles, miles on the clock and a result on the board. So I would expect that to be the case. What were your thoughts on Maguire and Lindelof? Um, I mean, I guess the same as they've always been. Um, they're not bad players. They're not... I'd like United to have better players than both of them. But a better player than Lindelof is essential, partly just to be better than Lindelof and also some legs are required alongside Maguire. You can't have two centre-backs that can't run. And that is what United have. And I said all the way through last season that United's defending was not as good as United's defensive record. Um, I mean, Chris Smalling is still at the club. He is better than Lindelof. Um, and I would be picking him. Um, I'm not sure why. I mean, you never you hear some rumours, and I don't have any kind of handle on the Alex Sellers rumours. Um, um, he may well... I mean, he not. He may well. He is much better going forward than Luke Shaw. Uh, I'd be, I'm kind of surprised that they're signing a fullback who isn't seriously fast because if you're not going to sign a centre back, then at least try and find some speed elsewhere to cover, to cover those defenders that aren't quick. But I do mm. think that, I, would, I, I think that Lindelof must have run out of chances. And if by his fit, then I would expect him to come in because it doesn't seem like two and a his fit yet. Um, and I would expect Juan Bissaka to come in because he gives you a bit more cover uh, behind behind the right side of centre-back, which has been Lindelof. But, yeah, I mean, Maguire, Maguire and Lindelof aren't the standard. I'm not sure why you would be trying to find a left-back, even though you need a left-back, when what you really need is a centre-back, unless you're absolutely certain that Tuanzebe is going to be good enough or that Mengi is going to be good enough and you're going to play them soon. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, uh, that new centre-back is essential. And, I mean... I've been on here for the last said it before United bought Maguire, that Maguire was might be better than what United had, but he definitely wasn't good enough. But I would be hesitant to judge the whole team, the defenders, based on how dodgily they played against Palace, because their average general median modish level of performance is a lot better than that. Like you make the point, it's interesting kind of talking about that defense and the point you make there that their defensive record was a lot better than their defending last season because, like you mentioned there a moment ago, that Liverpool pissed the league last season. Like they only conceded three goals less than Manchester United. So if you looked at it on that model alone, they're not that far off Liverpool. But actually, via the eye test, there is a, a huge gulf between them. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't. I mean, we should we also look at it the other way that Liverpool would do very well to win as many games by the odd goal a game. That kind of thing doesn't happen that often. But yeah, I don't think it would be particularly controversial to say that Liverpool's goalkeeper and defenders are, are better than United's individually and as a unit. And I also think there's a, an element of Liverpool's get better protection from the midfield because the teams approach playing the game in different ways. And Liverpool are a more settled team who've been playing together for longer. So that also makes a big difference. Um, but yeah, um, sometimes like when the season at United finished second in the league under Mourinho, the defensive record was good. But the defensive record was mainly good because De Gea stopped everything in sight. And last season, it felt like they gave up a lot of big chances that the other the opponents missed or that they just managed to scrape some kind of recovery challenge and get away with. But they didn't look like... You didn't feel confident when the team was defending that they wouldn't give up a goal or a chance. And I mean, sometimes I mean, when you're watching football, it's that feeling. Do I feel nervous here or do I feel, do I feel comfortable here? And there was quite a lot of times watching United defend where, as a United supporter, I felt uncomfortable. And that is a good indicator of an unreliable defence, I think. And is there another situation here, Daniel, where perhaps Greenwood, Martial and Rashford were actually overperforming last season and perhaps we got carried away with the strength of this Manchester United attack because they were devoid of opportunities on, on Saturday night? No, I don't think that. I think those are three excellent players. Um, um, like, um, you don't score the number of goals that Martial scored and in the way that he scored them. And it looked like a culmination of the improvement that's carried on through the career when he was brilliant when he turned up to think, oh, actually, maybe he's not as good as I literally saw him being with my eyes. Um, Rashford is out of form. I mean, he was out of form after the lockdown. Um, he played badly at the weekend. And this is a problem when you don't have any kind of replacement that you keep some, that you keep playing him through that form, whereas it might help to be taken out and have another player to bring in instead of him. Uh, but United don't really have that, so they haven't been able to do it. And Greenwood, as Ole said beforehand, um, was shouldn't have played during the summer. And, I mean, the idea of those internationals, that players... I mean, United are ultimately, and I, this is not... A, a, this is not really a complaint even, but United are, to some extent, collateral damage of coronavirus, that they played long into the close season, then the players, a lot of their players then played internationals and barely had a break at all. And I guess, looking back, perhaps what should have happened was that the authorities should have said, if you played in those later stages of the um, Europa League and Champions League knockouts, then you're not allowed to play in the international games. That would have made sense. But... You've got a player like Mason Greenwood, who must be physically, might well be feeling it. He he hasn't played that level of games at that level ever. Um, and whilst you can easily say, well, he's young, he should be strong, your body needs time to get used to doing certain things, which is one of the reasons why when managers bring players through, young players through, they put them in and take them out. Part of it is mental fitness and part of it is physical fitness. And both of those things were the case with Greenwood, even in a normal season. Whereas in the last season... The games were coming one after the other, and he was playing all of them because United you know, didn't have options. So the idea that after a little bit of time off, but not a lot of time off, and a lot of football, a lot of upheaval, he looked a bit, he looked a bit. I don't know what the word would be. Um, he just wasn't. He didn't produce the usual standard of performance you would expect from him against Palace. I would impute from that that. All these other circumstances were what the case was, not that we had all somehow misjudged Mason Greenwood and actually he's not as good as we think he is because he is every bit as good as we think he is. Is there not a case we made that City had exactly the same issues and produced a performance that was slicker and more physically energetic, at least in that first half last night? Yeah, for sure. City are better than United. I mean, that's not... We, we, we know, even, that, we know even, that. Even the physical, even the fitness side of it, like, which would... It seemed to me still that you have a young manager who's getting to grips with running a super club and hasn't quite got to the point where uh, even his conditioning is at the level that it's supposed to be. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, that would be, I mean, at that point, I, we're verging into speculation. I mean, we could definitely speculate that that might be the case. I need to also, I guess, have a closer look at which of City's players are playing as much football as United's. I mean, leading up to lockdown... Again, like, I don't want to make excuses. United were crap at the weekend, and it may well be that their conditioning coach isn't as good as City's. I don't know. It's possible. Um, it's more than possible. But 
City's players hadn't played as much leading up to lockdown as United because they hadn't been forced to plough through every game because they have proper strength in depth. Um, had, had Gabriel Jesus ran his ass off last night, had he played in the uh, had he played the international games? I mean, he definitely hadn't played any Nations League. I don't think Brazil played, so he is likely to have been fresher because he hadn't been overplayed to the same extent, and he had and he had more of a break. Um, okay, so fundamentally, so, it's about the size of the squad and the fact that they haven't made the I investment. Know which I don't know about. I, I can I, I can look at the size of the squad and I can look at how much the players played after lockdown and say, well, I can see that that is a fact. Okay. So I can see that, that is that is operative. So that goes back um, to Woodward's. City have better fitness coaches than United, and maybe they do, but I couldn't come to any kind of conclusion because I don't know whether that's true or not. So ultimately, this goes right back to the first question, who is responsible? And most of the responsibility seems to be with Woodward for not actually giving Solskjaer what he needs to succeed. Is this terminal, like, or is there a recovery to come at some point soon? Can, can Solskjaer wrestle this back? It's one game, of course. It's one game. United hadn't been beaten in the league since, uh, since the beginning of February. Um, so why would I ignore everything that I saw and then decide that this game that came in very particular circumstances, which we were just talking about, is going to tell me everything about everything that's going to happen next. Now, we can also look at the, the run that United went on and say, well, as they tired towards the end of the season, it became harder for them to get results and it became harder for them to create chances. But then, not that long before the end of the season, the last time they played Palace um, at Selhurst Park, they didn't, they didn't play particularly well that night. They looked tired that night, but... They, some of their attacking play was still brilliant, and some of the, those attackers are still really good players. Now, they've got some things to work out. Where does Van der Beek fit in? Um, I think that Van der Beek is going to give Paul Pogba um, is going to give Paul Pogba some thoughts about how well he's going to have to play to stay in his position. Because I don't think Van der Beek has come to sit the side. Um, he definitely doesn't give that impression, and he looks like a player who's good enough to start for United. But as, to go back to where I started, the main difference between United and Palace was ultimately the fitness. And there were other things going on as well. Perhaps the team in Man or they could have picked a better team. I think he could have picked better, a better formation as well. Like I look at United and I think this is not a 4 2 3 1 team, it's a 4 3 3 team. Because what you end up with in that situation is you end up with Pogba, who's the kind of second sitting midfield player, is much too deep too often. And if you play 4 3 3, then he wouldn't have the obligation or feel or be inclined or be told that he has to provide more defensive cover and he should be getting much further forward. And if that were to be the case, then United, I think, would have looked more like scoring in that period where they looked like they might get an equaliser. Who, who is that so, midfield three, then? Who is the, the middle three of the 4-3-3? Three, three? Um, I, I mean, to me at the moment, looking at it, I would have Fernandes and Van der Beek, and then it sort of depends on the opposition who you might have the other team to be. I mean... Pogba, in theory, should be able to play that anchor role. We've seen him play with that discipline for France. He's got the long-range passing, and he's got he's fast and he's strong. That's basically what you would be looking for in someone who can play that position. Whether Ole would ever pick him in that position, whether he would fancy playing in that position, that's a ridiculous thing to say. I mean, you, I, I, I don't know. But I would say that those three would work as a, as a threesome against a lot of teams. You might want to change it up and play a diamond in some games and then play two strikers. But if you do that, then you require quite a lot of attacking width from your fullbacks. And United aren't quite getting that at the moment. So there are when when you see when you watch any kind of game or any any kind of sporting event and something happens and then there's a result. There will always be lots of different things that combine to make the result what the result was, and there'll never be one thing, and some things will always have more to do with it than others. But I wouldn't look at that United performance against Palace and say, well, it's all gone to shit because of that, because there's so many other things that contributed to that, and I would also look at what I'd seen prior to then. Like, it's a fair point to wonder what it will take to get them getting results while they're getting fit, because I think that is a problem because you don't want to go five games without a win then you're under ridiculous pressure just to save the season uh, that early on and then that is that is problematic but yeah they do need to find a way of getting results over the next few games while they're getting themselves up to fitness but they haven't suddenly become much less good than they had proved over the course of half a season that they what that they are
you spoke about maybe taking Marcus Rashford out of the rotation. They don't really have much opportunity to do that at the moment. The best opportunity for that would be if they signed Jaden Sancho and then all of a sudden everybody would get a load of minutes and we'd get to see patterns emerge. Do you think it's more or less likely that Jaden Sancho is a Manchester United player by the end of the transfer window? I, I don't know. Um, I totally be speculating. It depends. Um, I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised either way. I mean, it's, it's fun. You know, United feels like they're sort of back Dortmund into a corner now, where everyone's uh, playing Billy Big Bollocks, where Dortmund say, "Well, he's not for sale," so that it requires some sort of climb down. But at the same time, for United to then go and offer, if United offer what the price is. There's no way Dortmund aren't going to take it because 120 million pounds for anyone, particularly in this market, is ridiculous money. Um, I'm I'm not sure. I just I don't know what United plans spend because if you look at, let's say they are indeed interested in Alex Telles, that could not be a difficult deal to do, but they still haven't done it, and so that suggests that maybe maybe there isn't any more money at all until players leave and no one's gone anywhere. So again, I'm totally speculating. Do I think Sancho will go to United? So at this point, my inclination is not, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did. Okay. And at 120 million as a Manchester United fan, are you happy with that? I couldn't care less how much money they That's spend the on thing, James isn't Sancho. It? Yeah. Because the alternative it just goes out in dividends. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I couldn't care less what they pay for Sancho. I understand why, as club owners, businessmen, they would bulk at playing 120 million pounds for a player in this market, and if they said, "Well, we're not doing that," but here's 100 million to go and spend on as many players as you think you can get with that money, um, and it turns out that they buy a different right winger or they buy a left back, a centre back, and another mid and a sitting midfield player, that would be that would be something as well. So, but I don't know. Daniel, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. All right, see you again, lads.